here and watching online. It's a joy to be together. Uh, we're joined by some visitors, guests, uh, Douglas and Tina McLennan. Thank you. Nice to see you. It's been a couple of years and a couple of visitors over here. Yes, lovely. Thanks very much. Uh, right. No, very short, very few notices. Last week we had about 10 minutes of notices. So just very briefly to remind you of one of the ones last week about the theme that we'll hope to have. Oh, welcome back from your holiday too. Did you have a good time? Excellent. Uh, one of the themes was in memory of, and it is to do with loved ones and your families who have passed away. And if you'd like to remember someone close to you, uh, then please send me some uh, details, a photo, just a message. And I received the first one yesterday and a very beautiful one it was. So please <coughs> encourage, we'd like to do it within two weeks and it'll all depend on the volume of people that respond. But you know, obviously you can't be coerced, but we'd love you to take part. So that's really the only item of news. We have a Kirk session this Thursday after the, after the prayer meeting. Now there are special dates in people's lives, such as anniversaries, when they thank God for precious years shared together, shared experiences, all that they've enjoyed. And there are, <coughs> are there other occasions to, to celebrate. And this, this week, I'll be able to celebrate that it's four years since my induction here in Carloway and five years since I came. So I have many reasons to say, Lord, for the years, I give you thanks this day. That's our opening hymn, number 428.
wonderful praise. So let's come before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, our God in heaven, we thank you that we have already expressed the joy and blessedness of our hearts to you, our God, our creator, our savior and redeemer, all encompassed in the gospel of Christ, revealed through him and by his spirit to us. And we pray, O oh Lord, this day that there will be a quickening of that revelation to every single soul here and watching, to those listening with intent, to those listening with a sense of hopelessness. We pray, O oh God, that the gospel of hope will come with power and bring hope to all. Hope of this day and hope of tomorrow, but best of all, Lord, hope for eternity. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that are ours in Christ. We never take them for granted, and so we come before the throne of heaven to ask for your blessing, to ask for your mercy and forgiveness for things that we have done and said wrong and ought not to have, <coughs> things that we ought to have done and did not. For all such sins, Lord, we confess. And we ask that you would remake us and remold us to be Christians of devotion, of compassion, of attentiveness to your word and to your ways, that we would be mindful of the small things that so often bless our lives that we might think is trivial, but that we would, as Christ himself, stoop down and wash the disciples' feet, that we would see no, no job, no mission too, too small or too insignificant, but that we would find true value and meaning in it all, for as we are doing it, we are doing it unto the Lord. Lord our God, this church meets to give glory to your name, and every act and expression here is designed to do that, to honor God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that God would be pleased to make his dwelling place among us for this hour and every time we gather. We pray, Lord, that you would change the water into wine, that you would change the ordinary into the extraordinary by your holy presence. For the love of God transforms all that is base and simple and mundane. And so we ask you, Lord, to do so today to our souls, to our hearts, to those who may be weary in life, to those who are troubled by illness in their family, that you will be the burden bearer for all our needs as we present them to you, Lord, silently in our hearts now to lift up the broken heart the wounded, the rejected in our midst. We pray for our parish, that you would reach out, O oh Lord, even through this church ministry and the church next door, that together our voices would proclaim that God's love is towards all, that his arms of embrace are waiting to gather sinners to himself, to gather backsliders, to wash them clean, to renew their strength and zeal for Christ. We pray that such a work would take place, Lord, for we have read it in, in the history books of our past generations, the wondrous works that God has done here upon the island that we love. And so we pray, O oh God, will you not do it again in these days? Will you not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing over us that we can barely contain, that our barns will be full and overflowing of soul saved of worship that goes on day and night as a holy as a holy incense to heaven lord these are not myths or fables but these are realities that your gospel allows us to dream of to hope of and to pray for so we pray for these things O oh lord today that heaven would come and visit us once again as an island and here in this community that you turn the eyes and hearts and minds of those who are lost in the trespass and sin this very morning and day, that you would turn them, Lord, to consider the claims of Christ for their soul, that he came into the world to die for each and every single person, and never to spurn such an offer of salvation. O oh Lord God, will you not do it again, we pray? Will you not quicken your church, for we slumber, we are so slothful, so lazy to get out into our community and to win the lost for you. So so mindful of ourselves, Lord, and our own material priorities. Oh, Lord, will you not turn us? Will you not turn our hearts towards the things that endure and really matter? That we would see in each person a soul either saved or lost. That we would pray and have a spiritual zeal and endeavor that would sometimes overwhelm us, even in the watches of the night. Lord, awaken us, this church. Awaken us all, Lord, to spiritual realities. And we pray for all your congregations across the island, that together, no matter what differences of theology and expression of liturgy 
that we might with one voice and with cry up to God in heaven that you will bless this island once again with days of mighty awakening and outpouring, Lord. This is what we live for. We don't live just to fill in the week's schedule of meetings. Do this and do that. But we meet with the living God that he would do what only he can do. And so on behalf of this church, Lord, we make our prayers and requests. Turn the tide within us and let the blessings of God flow upon us. Hear our prayers. Forgive all our sins. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Time to lift up the name of Jesus, which we'll be doing throughout this morning. Jesus is the name we worship, number 870. song of worship there. So we turn to the scripture. The reading is from the book of Colossians chapter 1 verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the holy and faithful in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace be to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, <coughs> just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. 
You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray that in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every good way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have re redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Now you may notice I've been reading my Bible from a lovely tartan cover on it today. And I remember sharing a children's address a few years, and it must have been over three years ago, when the theme was you can't judge a book by its cover, and you can't always judge a cover by its cover. And the question was, boys and girls and everyone else who wanted to join, where do you think I bought this tartan cover? Was it in Scotland? <laughs> no. Was it in America, where they love tartan? No. Cast your minds back. Can anyone remember where it came from? China. <laughs> China. <laughs> no, it wasn't. No. Oh, well, if you remember my sermons as little as you remember the children's <laughs> address, think of Africa. In Nigeria. The, I bought this at a conference in Nigeria. I was totally shocked to see it on the book stand. And there it was. And I told the story also that sometime later I was at a conference in London and walking about with my Bible. And I see somebody else. He was a. It, it was a, he was a Nigerian pastor, and he too had been back home and bought a Bible. So that's, that's, just, that's just it. But one thing about Nigeria is it is an amazing place for the gospel. It's a, the, the nation with the highest population, 120 million plus, but it is fervent and passionate for Jesus. And our theme today is that all over the world, God's spirit is moving. And in Nigeria and in many other places, that will be the case. So we're going to sing this short song. All over the world, God's spirit is moving. And we'll sing it through and then repeat the first verse. Thank you. We'll stand to sing.
doesn't that sound wonderful? Doesn't that sound like the kind of world we want to live in? A world where God is moving in power in all the nations? Well, he is, and we'll hear more about it today. So I'm taking the theme from one of the verses and from that heading in the song. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit. This is what Paul wrote to the Colossians. And what a wonderful realization it must have been for Paul and the apostles when they began to preach this new message. This was a radical new message. And when you preach something new, you're not sure how your audience or the listeners are going to take to it. So he went out into the market, into the, into the open places, into the synagogues, and preached this new message. And to his amazement and to his delight, obviously, to the apostles, thousands of people responded. They believed the word the word of hope that is contained in this gospel. And how they saw lives change. They saw communities change. And it was a radical message, which we, I think, have grown so used to. We don't see its radical nature. Familiarity breeds kind of disdain. So maybe we need to re-examine the core issues and matters of what this is all about that we might discover something more dynamic. And sometimes we've got to shake off a sense of, well, I think I understand. I know what it's about. It's the gospel. It's this and that. But we need to sometimes push the parameters back. And I hope you're, hope you're all here willing to do that for yourselves, to learn maybe something new, to expand your knowledge, but also your vision of God at work by his spirit, so that we would truly fulfill the third verse, or the second verse, right here in this church because basically that's what we're here to pray and to worship that God would be right here in this church and in his blessings to make our life so wonderful so if the, is the gospel still the same which it is is it still bearing fruit throughout the world and is it bearing fruit here in our island in our parish and is it bearing fruit here through this congregation through the preaching and worship. Now you'll, you'll likely know the meaning, the root meaning of the word gospel. It means good news. And it was a term used throughout the Old Testament as well as in general society. We all love to hear good news. Good news of someone recovering from illness, someone getting married, someone a blessing in their life. And we rejoice to hear the good news. And it's appreciated by everyone. The giver of the good news and the recipients of the good news. And that's what this gospel is about. Linguistically, it derives from the old Anglo-Saxon, God's spell. God's spell that becomes gospel. So, the old, this, a gospel was preached in the Old Testament, a different gospel, as we know. But we see glimpses of this, for example, in the book of Isaiah, where the prophet says, You who bring good news, the gospel to Zion, go up on a high mountain, you who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. It was to proclaim that God was with them, God was for them and fighting for them. And the recipients, the people in the villages and in the cities of the, of the land would be encouraged, would be strengthened to know, as we would too, to hear a word saying, God is with you. He speaks to you personally, to your family. God is with you. It changes your whole perspective. Oh, God is with me. I need not be afraid of what lies ahead. I need not worry about my future because God is with me. And, his, and it's good just to say that to yourself today. Yes, God is with you. It's not a presumption. We're not coercing God to be with us, but he has promised to be with us. And so he is here for us. He is here for us to strengthen us. So good news then and good news. And wouldn't it be wonderful if once again, that good news would be proclaimed not just on the hills of Israel, but on the hills of Lewis, preaching the gospel to the villages, the town, and seeing that God's spirit would again be moving. Maybe we're doing that in a measure today, nowadays, by live streaming. Most churches have <coughs> viewers who don't go to church. So we're preaching the gospel to our, our community, but we would, there's no substitute, I believe, for going out into the community pitching your tent, plugging in your amplifier, preaching the gospel and gathering a crowd and seeing people come. Maybe that's the way it used to be and things have changed. But it's, it's such a dynamic witness in the community when there is a gospel uh, presentation and a gospel witness that's public. We're not just in behind the walls 
comfy and secure on a Sunday. But we have a desire and a zeal to go out into the highways and byways, which I believe we ought. Not everybody needs to do. But at the heart of it, there should be a prayer for you, for our church, to be a mission-minded church that we proclaim the gospel. So we see good news in the Old Testament and we see it in the New Testament. And the first glimpse we see is not really classified as good news, but it's the one who prepared the way. John the Baptist came and his, his message was simply repent and come back to the faith of your ancestors, to the law of Moses. It was a big challenge because people had strayed from it. But that was simply, he was calling people back to their basic, like calling you back to your basic vows. The vows that people took when they were christened, when you, took, you brought your children. These vows can slip away. Children that you brought to church that you raised slip away. Parents who bring their children to church for the, slip away to the community. They forget that they took vows. So there was a call then and there's a call now to turn from that and come back to church, come back to your faith, come back to the faith that you were christened into and raised by your parents in Sunday school. And that's what, that's what he was preaching. Radical in itself, but nowhere near as radical as the message that Jesus and then later the apostles would preach. And that message was this. Repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is layer upon layer of new dynamic within this message of good news. And the gospel that, that, that we know it could not be preached until Christ was crucified and raised from the dead. Prior to that, Jesus taught the law. He taught people to abide by the law. But he couldn't preach forgiveness of sins fully until he himself had shed his blood. So there's a, there's a parting of the way. Jesus teaches the old law. He calls people back. But then he establishes the new covenant whereby he says, repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Through what? Through the blood that he shed. And in early years, this, this was a radical, we are used to it today. We're sitting and we're listening, yeah, I've heard that. That's, but it, it was so radical in, in the first century. Paul, it was radical to him, but it was also radical to the hearers. Radical. And it caused, and it's been, it's been recorded that the Christian church in the first century, they turned the world upside down. They were so on fire for God with this new message. They went out, they preached, and they turned the world upside down. Nowadays, we might say that in many instances, it's, it's a reverse. The world has turned the church upside down. The church has assimilated and absorbed so much of the world's standards of morality, of philosophy, and, and taken it in. Instead of us as being the, the vital voice in the wilderness, speaking to the, not in condemnation or judgment to the world, but to the world of a morality that is biblical. And so there is a standard that we raise in the church. It may, it may rub up people the wrong way, but it's, it's not our own theology. We're proclaiming what God sees as being right behavior, right morality. And if God says it's good, then we can rest assured it's, it's good to proclaim. And the Christian message and lifestyle also was radical. And we see this in the book of Acts chapter 2 where it says that everyone was filled with awe and all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They so, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. That, now that is a radical lifestyle. And this week I had an opportunity to do a little bit of that when uh, John McCaskill asked if he could borrow the car, one of my two cars. Well, <laughs> Well, he was waiting for his new van to arrive, for his new van to arrive. It should have come earlier in the week. So he asked, and I, I was thinking when I heard this, come on, Dan, can you remember if you've got two cars, you should give it to him. Now, I, I must say I was slow in offering, but he came to me and said, yes, John, you can have the car. There it is. And he, that was easy. To, I'm sure you would all do the same too, wouldn't you? For your name, yes. But what if John said, I need this car permanently? Oh, wow, that's a, that's a challenge to the heart. <laughs> it's all very well when Jesus, if you have two tunics and, and you're, someone asks you, oh, yes, you can have my tunic, but you can't have my BMW or whatever you've been driving. <laughs> so it, it, it challenges what's in our heart, how radical or how encompassed in our own life. So 
please don't ask for my car, I don't think. <laughs> so how would we understand the core, es the core elements of the gospel? Well, maybe with an acrostic today will help. We're going to look at the word gospel itself and go through each, each letter representing some aspect of and it'll spell out the important aspects that, that I hope will, will convey to you. Now the gospel, Paul said, this gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So whatever is contained within it, it has been defined as containing power, the power of God. God has invested his power in this gospel. So we want to, in a sense, remind ourselves of the dynamic that is, that is at work when we preach the gospel. So... It wasn't a, a philosophy that was created by men. It wasn't a, a teaching devised by clever, wise people, of whom there were many in those days, the, the Greek uh, uh, philosophers and sages. It, wasn't, it didn't derive from the first letter is. That's where it came from. The gospel originated with God. He is the instigator, the source of this gospel. No cleverness, no fancy ideas, no human effort has gone into making this. As Paul says elsewhere, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. This is directly from God. So, whatever that news is, it is behoves us all to listen attentively to it. If this message is come from God, it's not a clever bit of philosophy, it's not a new age ideology that we can give partial attention to. No, this has come, it's originated with the creator of all good and perfect things. That's what I would call everyone to, to do today who's watching and listening, to listen to it even with a deeper, a deeper desire to understand it, to understand the grace that is within this gospel because it originates from God. It's not just something that the church and the minister feels he has to do every week to preach this gospel, but he is proclaiming, he is proclaiming the very words of life, the words that if we take them into our hearts through faith, then we receive the benefit and blessings of them. If we don't, then we do not receive the benefit. So there is this passion and urgency each week to, to preach the gospel, to cause those who are slumbering, those who have heard this message hundreds of times and seem impervious to it, to suddenly receive something that will awaken their soul and really quicken them. And this has come, this is every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. So we can trust this gift as you would trust a gift from your earthly father. So this gospel has come from him. So first of all, God, which is a good place to start for all that we talk with. Next, in, in the G-O, God offers. What does he offer? Paul writes in Romans, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. This is the offer, that a person can be made right with God person can be found pleasing and acceptable in the sight of a holy God. A drunkard, a murderer, a thief, a self-righteous person in society, every walk of life can find the righteousness of God through faith in this gospel. That is what is being offered. A change of clothes from rags to the, to the clothes of righteousness that Christ offers us all. And we would see, and so often we do, our own righteousness. And many people keep themselves back from coming to faith. They say, well, I'm good enough, I'm not. So you have your own self-righteousness. You, your own value of yourself is your estimation that God has of you. Well, it's not. Our righteousness, even the best acts that we could do, it, the Bible says they are like filthy rags. So we just acknowledge that and say, Lord, I've tried to be good. I've tried to be virtuous and live a holy life, but it hasn't worked. And that's a good confession. So we lay that aside. And that's, that's the perfect situation. Then God has got you as you are. In your goodness and your badness and all your faults and flaws. And it's always a healthy thing to acknowledge our faults and flaws and weaknesses. Because God sees through every facade that we try to pretend that we're better than him. <coughs> so this ego, I'm okay kind of attitude is a symptom of that self-righteousness. 
and we want to exchange that. This is the plea of the gospel. Let it go. And this is what Paul again says. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the great exchange. And the phrase to be sin can be better filled out by saying to be a sin offering. That's really what it's saying. And we see that pattern in the Old Testament. An offering had to be made on behalf of sin. There were different types of offering, guilt, and uh, as well as shame, and as well as, um, I forget the other ones too, a peace offering. On, on behalf of sin, atonement had to be made. So the offering is being made. What, what is that offering? God is offering himself in the form of his son to be that righteousness, to be that sin offering for you that we see. Christ is the sin offering for my soul, for your soul. And that is right at the heart of this gift. It is the gift of the gift of God, because he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Indeed, God graciously gives you and I all that we would desire, ever, could ever wish for in Christ. It's not all that we wish for to satisfy our soulish life, but it's all to enrich our lives. And he does bless us with material goods, two cars, uh, things, you know, the blessings of life. And, and, you know, I can honestly say that to have nothing and be happy is fine and well. To have plenty and be happy is also fine. So God, I believe, would want to prosper us in the basics of life, not to be hungry and homeless, not to be without a job. That there are standards that God would want his, his people to have and to enjoy, the blessings of health and home, security, etc., etc. So these are the gener generous gifts that God offers Christ for you. It's for you, everyone. So the next one, G-O-S, he offers us salvation. God is offering himself as our sin offering to bring us salvation. And what is salvation? Again, a, pra a phrase, of a word that we know so well. Speaking, speaking of it biblically, it covers deliverance. Now, that's not a word we often use in church, but we use it in the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from evil. Are we conscious of what we're saying? Deliver us from evil. Where in the world? Deliver us also from the evil one, the evil one who is against our soul, who is, who is against our lives. And later in the chapter, Paul fills this up and says, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. That's where we were. Pre-Christian days, we were in the dominion of darkness, but God has rescued us from that and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, where there is light and freedom and joy. And that is the great exchange. We move kingdoms. We might look the same, but in within ourselves. And we have an identity now that is a very different from the spiritual identity that we are we are citizens of heaven. That's on our passport from now on. We have moved from different kingdoms. And what brings us peace is he who said, the Lamb of God is indeed the highest expression of the peace offering found in the Old Testament. For the chastisement that brought you and I peace was upon him. And by his wounds you are healed. And this is why we sang today, Jesus is the name we worship, Jesus, is the name we honour. Because the gospel is all about Jesus Christ. In every aspect of fulfilment, of atonement, of forgiveness, of peace, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, as one of the modern hymns says. And I think that helps us to really focus what is salvation. It is all about proclaiming Jesus Christ, what he's done for you, not just way back then, but what he does for you today, who forgives all the sins, who heals your sicknesses, who blesses you with peace. We don't just have the little blessings or the big blessings of salvation when we're converted, but we continue to discover them. When you're sick, what do you do? Do you pray to your Father? If we, if we do truly believe Psalm 103, who, who forgives thy sins, yes, we'll say amen to that. But then do we say who forgives thy, who, and who heals thy diseases? Well, we're not so sure about that. But these are the promises of God that we could say, yes, we believe that. And so when someone is ill, we don't presumptuously say, oh, I'm going to pray for you. We, we take the promises of God. I will heal the sick when they come to me sincerely. And the, the promise, Jesus made these promises too. 
with the leadership of the church. And we've done that in recent times. And if someone is still among you, call the elders. Call the elders. And that's what happened a few <coughs> weeks ago. For the, I won't mention her name today, but the lady who took a stroke she, a few days after being communed. The elders came and anointed her with oil and laid hands. And she, in that time, made a, a remarkable recovery. It wasn't just by chance it happened. It was because the men who came were believing in the promises of God that when they prayed in Jesus' name, Jesus' power was going to flow in a measure into that woman. And so they did. So it is all about Jesus. So recapping, God offers salvation. How does he do that? Through the promises that are in his word and scripture. They're sealed in the covenant, but they are laid out for us, for you and I. And he who promised is faithful to bring them all to pass. No matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes and amen in Christ. And so we can reach out as it were, Lord, I want to receive that. And I want to receive that. And we are receiving the benefits of the covenant of grace that he has entered into on your behalf. We are engaging with it. It's our yes and amen to the promises that affirm you. The promises are there for you. But if you just blankly look at them, they, they mean nothing. But if you affirm them in your heart and say, I believe that, yes and amen. The Spirit of God quickens them into your experience. And you then are a recipient of the blessings of God. That, that's what I believe happens. When we accept the gospel, salvation, we receive forgiveness, we receive peace, and we become new creations in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and give us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Then he says, so we make our appeal to be reconciled. That's the message from this pulpit so often, maybe repetitively. Everyone here, everyone watching, be reconciled to God. Do not remain a stranger to grace. Do not remain outside the penfold looking in. But we make a strong appeal, as Paul did, to embrace the gospel as it's been preached. To embrace that it's a personal gospel for you. Not just for your neighbor, but for yourself and for you to seriously take it on board today and not shrug it off. And Every time the gospel is preached in the world, that is the, that is the aim. The preacher is seeking to reconcile men and women, boys and girls, to God our Father and Creator. And we know today, you can be sure that across the world, all over the world, there will be thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people who will be professing faith in Jesus Christ for the first time. I, I couldn't find the statistics, but I remember looking it up some time ago of the numbers of people you know, roughly speaking, from Christian organizations who brought the data together of the, the numbers, the thrilling numbers of people who are coming to faith today. All over the world, God's Spirit is here. And it's such an inspiration for us. At times when we don't see a great activity and people coming to faith, but the Spirit of God is still the same. And because he's working over in Africa or South America or in Asia, he can work with us too when we receive the promises, when we cooperate with God. So we thank God that all over the world, this gospel today will be bearing fruit. And wouldn't it be wonderful if today in Carlowick, if today online, it would bear fruit too. It's preached not with purpose to be repetitive, but that it would do something in the hearts and minds of everyone. And that would be our deepest longing as, as elders and leaders in the church. So God offers salvation promises of what? And the last two together, eternal life, eternal life. That's what it, the summation of all the promises come to this. He is offering us eternal life. And that just doesn't mean life when we die. It's not pie in the sky when we die. It's eternal life now. It's this blessed Holy Spirit coming into our lives the, the minute, the moment we receive Christ. And then we are on a spiritual journey. We have received the deposit, which we spoke of recently. The deposit within us of the Spirit, which guarantees our full inheritance when we do die. But you have to have the deposit <coughs> within you now. And so this is what God holds out in the very 
well known verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And it's always salutary for everyone, whether you're a mature Christian or watching it, to say to yourselves, do I have eternal life in me? And you'll know yourself within your heart if you answer yes or no. Scripture says, he who has the Son has eternal life. He who doesn't, so it's, it's very clear. You're, you have the Son, you have life. You don't have the Son of God, you don't have eternal life. And we plead, and Paul makes that strong pleading each time, so do I, I plead. It will be a repetitive one. But it's to come to that understanding and to be saved. And the preaching of the gospel, since it's good news, it always requires a response. It's not just given, left, but it, in a sense, it demands a response. And you know that we're not a church that looks for immediate responses. We never ask for people to raise their hand or to come to an altar. We don't, we don't do that. We may do, but we don't foresee it. That's not the kind of people or church we are. But we are looking for the deeper work whereby people in their hearts are making that, that response as fervently as if they were running to the front. And if you've been to crusades in, in the UK, that's what I came to faith, under conviction up in the, up in the stands, suddenly realizing this is it, coming down, embarrassed, what am I doing coming down from the, it, it, it brought my thinking, that's the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed, so he preaches it unashamedly, and so, so do I today, because I know it is the power of God. He'll change your life, even if you're a mature Christian, and if you have troubles and woes and sorrows and difficulties now, it can change your situation because the promises of God are sure that he'll be with you to unlock, to unlock your difficulty, your challenge, and to bring peace to you. So it's a message for everyone, Christian and non-Christian. And the word is within you, it's in your heart, as the Bible have often said this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is it. That is the essence of the gospel. We preached, we've heard, and then if you confess with your mouth, with your mouth, and believe in your heart, these are the two components, the head and the heart. Bring faith, bring conviction, bring affirmation to you that you are saved. So who here today and watching has believed, I would say most, I cannot say for sure of everyone, but most, and who here, watching online, has believed, has heard and believed for the first time? That is the challenge that I'm putting out to, to you in your home, wherever you're watching, that you'll respond to this word today, this good news, that God sent his son to die for your sin. And so you will complete the gospel story in your life. God has offered salvation to you through his promise of eternal life. So will your heart say, Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful message of the gospel that has been preached for over 2,000 years. We thank you for the very day, the first day it was preached, and 3,000 were added to the church and believers. We thank you, God, that all over the world your spirit is at work as men and women faithfully preach and serve Christ. Others are coming to faith. We thank God for the faithful missionaries and ministers throughout all the nations of the earth. We pray for our own patch, our own vineyard here, Lord, on the island. And we do pray again and ask urgently, Lord, that you would send a day of, of change, of reformation spiritually in our society, in our attitude to the gospel, that you would break down the walls even today, Lord, of, of hearts that are resistant to this message. Let the graciousness of God, the mercy and tenderness of God lead some to repentance. And so we commit the word that has gone forth. May it bear fruit here in this congregation and with those who have been watching online. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we ask it. Amen.
I serve a risen Saviour. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. So it's a great way to affirm our own faith today as we conclude. Number 295. the salvation to spread forth within our spirits. Bless each heart here, each one who has joined us for this hour of worship. May we go in the name of the Lord, knowing his peace, love and joy. Through Christ's name we ask it. Amen.